There we go. Welcome, Timothy. Welcome, everybody. So uh, good to see you guys. We're just going to jump right in here with Timothy Benson. You know, we've talked a few times, and I've talked to other a few other people about what you began to talk about a few. Well, you've been talking about it for a long time. <laughs> we've just had a couple conversations about it, about writing a new constitution. Hmm. And... I remember seeing, and I forwarded it to Timothy, uh, uh, what's his name, did a, uh, can't remember his name right now, did a Liberty Charter, Gary Beaton, did a Liberty Charter that's really, really good. If you guys look that up on Google, you can find it, but but uh, I think it's time for another rewriting uh, that would be a legal document that we could uh record in the uh, books of heaven and uh, begin to govern from that perspective. So uh, uh, I'm sure Timothy has been uh, been uh, with the Lord on that and finding and digging deeper into that revelation. So I just want to uh, give him all the time he wants. Uh, so uh, unbuckle your seat belts and get ready to fly a little bit. Don't buckle don't your seat belts. Seat that's a restriction. That's a limitation. So don't buckle your seat belts around us. And so, Timothy, welcome back. Good to see you. Thanks for the short notice. I just mentioned it today to him. He said, yeah, yeah, I'll do this. So uh, welcome and good to see you, my friend. Hey, you might watch. Uh, I don't know. I, I invited Terry. No, Terry, I invited uh, Tony Davis to join if he uh, can. He tried to call me a few minutes ago, so I don't think he's on your membership thing, so you might watch if he tries to come in. Let him, let him in if you don't mind. Yeah, that's fine. Anybody um, can invite a friend once in a while just to... I sent him the link, so he'll probably be able to come in, but I, I, I don't know what he was calling me for. I didn't take the call. I just let him know I was on it. Okay. Uh, anyway, he's the guy that invited me originally to Hawaii, and we've been talking about this topic over there, so I thought he might want to join um this goes back for me quite a ways uh in 1990 i started going through kind of an upheaval uh it was a wonderful year because i, I retraced the trail of tears and, and then it kicked off a ministry of reconciliation that ended up taking me to 28 countries um I saw a lot of a lot of healing and restoration and forgiveness that came here in the state of oklahoma especially with the native peoples was still a lot of work to do in that area, but I realized that I was unraveling, uh, for the most part, on the Trail of Tears. That, that our team that did that, we were unraveling a broken covenant that was 1834, and we were dealing with it in 1990. You know, so it's more than a hundred years. Uh, something that was left undone and uncorrect and and injustice with God. And one of the things I wanted to just remind everybody, is sometimes when we're calling out to God for justice, it doesn't always happen the way we think. It doesn't always come, come as soon as we think. And often we think we're going through a problem and God's supposed to fix it because he loves us, which is true. But if we don't know the timing and the real way God sees it, then when we're asking him to rectify a problem to give us justice, we may not understand how to include everybody that he's trying to address that problem with. And so I started thinking more in terms of class action suits and thinking that if I've got a problem and I've got an injustice, then maybe I'm not the only one with that problem. And, and it's also I considered it an injustice if I'm asking God to fix it for me, and then I'm not praying for anyone else that has the same problem. Yeah. Now, that took me into thinking more about governmental issues with Jesus, because uh, when I said, help me understand how to unravel this trail of tears iniquity, he said, well, first you should ask me how to understand, you know, or you should ask for my help to understand me and my kingship. You know, up to that point, I think I had a pretty good relationship with Jesus that was centering around his, his saving me. And, you know, I often called him Lord, but because I grew up in a democracy and I grew up in a place where we consider political freedom, I really didn't understand very much about the protocols of the king. You know? never really hung out with the king very much. 
I'm not a legal person in the sense that I think like a lawyer. I've had to learn that. So I, I really didn't think about these kinds of things being procedural. I just, you know, barged into the throne of glory and said, I need help. I got a problem. You need to fix it. And uh, I got answers a lot of times. So very often God will answer our prayers just because he loves us and he's giving us a mercy response, but he isn't always fixing the whole problem until we learn how to be judicial and approach him as a king. You know? And I'm obligated, but really obligated in my connection with the body of Christ to always consider that I may be representing the body on something and it's not just about little old me. You know? So I slowed down a little bit. I looked at the problem saying that I, I thought I was unraveling a iniquity that was innocent bloodshed and broken covenant that went from Georgia to Oklahoma. And in by the end of that journey, I realized I was also unraveling my own house. I was unraveling my own family's history. I was unraveling my DNA. And I was reconnecting with something of, that was identifying with Jesus that I didn't even know or understand until he began to open my eyes and show me. And then he brought evidence of it. So at the same time that was going on, that was a prayer journey, a uh, prophetic act. Uh, it was just an act of obedience. Uh, I can tell you, honestly, 90% of the time through that whole trip, I thought, um, I was disqualified. I just thought, why did Jesus want me to do this? I, there's lots of other people that he could have picked out to do this that would have been better at it than me. And even though I know how to pray and I hear God a little bit, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. I was just obeying him. And he was putting me in, in a process of judicial governing that was way beyond my, my level of wisdom at that time. But I began to, to pray differently. Along the way, I started realizing that I need to pray differently because I'm asking God to fix me most of the time or I'm asking him to fix a problem that I'm aware of in the body of Christ. I'm not al always asking him for justice in a way that makes sense. You know, I don't even understand uh, a lot of things about justice even to this day, uh, meaning I don't understand how he views it sometimes. But at the same time that was going on back in the late 80s, early 90s, I was an elder of a local church. I wasn't the only guy in charge. We had a group of eight people that were in leadership. And we all worked together. Each one of us kind of understood that we had different giftings. So we really were a great team. And I had a very small role, sometimes because I was traveling some. So I wasn't always considered the pastor. I wasn't the one preaching all the time, but I was always involved in some of the prayers and leadership. Um, and when we decisions were made, I was part of those things. Um, and God began to blow us up. We had a really good church. We had everything outwardly and everything functionally seemed like we were working really, really well. And Jesus just began to dismantle it. And I realized that when I began praying for justice, he actually started dismantling uh, almost everything that was religious in my life. And I didn't know wh why those things were connected, because I, at that time, I thought everything I was doing that was religious was really good. <laughs> and most of it was. <laughs> but just because it's good, it isn't always God. And so I, I want to first say, before I get into the Constitution topic, that... You, you will have to unravel yourself from any connection in your spirit, soul, and body to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Or you cannot take up the cause of justice because it must be connected to the king and to life. I can't try to bring justice to the earth by just calling for good things to happen. I have to know how to how to bring the, the inhabitable manifest presence of God into the situation. He makes a judicial kingly decision and that changes the whole scenario. And so I asked him why we were having some problems in the church. And, and let me describe a little bit. Our problems weren't normal things. They weren't just administrative or people. They were uh, spiritual. We, we would get a, a miracle would happen one day and then we would pray the same way a dozen times and not see anything. 
when we first began praying for people to be healed on a regular basis and preaching that God uh, about the power of God and about the Holy Spirit, the first eight people we prayed for that were um, critically ill, they all died. Mm. And we actually got a reputation in our city that you might want to think twice before you ask those guys to pray for you, <laughs> which is troubling now. Now, fortunately, everybody that died did know Jesus, but it was it was deeply frustrating to be praying in faith and believing that we're gifted and knowing that God wants to heal this person, and then we still saw them die. And so I, I kept going back to Jesus each time a person would, would end up buried, saying, what did we miss, you know? I just couldn't make myself believe that that was the perfect will of God. So I was saying, what did we miss? Is there anything that we could have prayed that we didn't pray? Is there something I didn't understand how to, how to apply? And I kept getting really interesting answers. You know, um, the first one I got was, it was not that man's time to die. For this reason, many among you are sick and some are, uh, uh, because you've not discerned the body for this reason, many among you are sick and some have even died. That was the quote Jesus quoted his word. That was his answer for why that guy died. And I said, well, that's unjust, Jesus. You know, that ought to qualify for a, a prayer of resurrection. You know? He said, you could pray for that man to be resurrected before he's buried if you will apply my word correctly. But to do that, you're going to have to go back to every broken relationship in his life and mm. ask for repentance. Mm. Because someone that I ordained to pray for him is refusing to pray for him. That's why he's being buried. Mm. Wow, that's like, okay, that was an eye opener. So, yeah. uh, geez, Jesus, I don't know how to do that. I don't even know who all that man knows. You know, I know his family. Maybe we can figure that out. All the people that I've just not. I'm sorry. Uh, what were you saying again? <laughs> Was that somebody's mic went on? <laughs> I didn't know if you were asking a question. Or, okay. If you want to ask a question, raise your hand. Terry, you watch for that because I'm not good at that. But anyway, I had a, a sense that we had a protocol that God was trying to show us. He wasn't saying you did anything wrong. He was saying you're missing some things that you could be applying if you understood my ways a little better. And if you were really walking in my word on the level that I've, I've enabled you. But I began to really ponder this idea that we're not doing communion correctly because I had been taught in my childhood that that scripture in, in Corinthians just means examine yourself and make sure you don't have any sin in your life before you take communion. I had not viewed, I might have a sin in my life if I've ceased to pray for a person or if I've broken a relationship with them just because I don't think that they're valuable, but Jesus does. Right? But I never thought that that was life-threatening. Until that scripture began to open up, I realized, wow, we've got a, a major problem in the body of Christ because almost everybody I know has gone through some broken covenants and broken relationships. And therefore, maybe that's why we're not seeing a lot of our prayers answered. Now, that made me start thinking much more judicial because instead of just saying, oh, God, do this, I started saying, how do I pray? I began to ask Jesus when I had a problem in front of me, I would say, Jesus, how are you praying for this person? give me some protocols to follow. I'll come into agreement with what you're doing and what you're saying. And I know you always get your prayers answered. And so if there's some procedural things that I need to do, I know I'll figure that out if I can hear clearly what you're praying and come into agreement with you. And I sort of slowly began to give up my right of just barging into the throne room and telling Jesus what I wanted and by God, you got to do it because you're my king. And I hope that's not offensive to anybody, but I, I realized that most of my prayers up to that point had been like that, that I was boldly going into the throne and, and holding God accountable to his word, but not always asking him how to walk in his ways. All right. He came back then about the 
about the eighth person that died, he, I was greatly frustrated and grieved. It was a lady that had eight children. Uh, she was 48, 42, 43 years old. Uh, it just seemed like the absolute no way this lady should be leaving the earth yet. You know? And um, I was so, I had spent night and day in the hospital with her family for four days. And uh, I was just totally broken because I thought, this is the one I didn't think we would lose. And then I, I asked Jesus, what do I need to change? You know, is there, did, did we fall short of your glory with this one too? Or is this what you were planning for her? And the Lord said to me, it's a little of both. They said, I, I, I'm going to let you see her. And I'm going to let you see her in my glory. And I want you to know that um, she's already been in front of my face and she doesn't want to come back. So I don't want you to pray for her to, to um, come out of the coma and live. She's made a decision to be with me. And I thought, gosh, I don't, I know she loves Jesus like crazy, but I just thought she's leaving little kids. She's leaving her husband. She's, you know, it, it, it's just the, the burden on the body. I thought we're going to have a, a, a widower and some really young orphans. And it just seemed not the way I wanted it. So I was like, Jesus, your ways are always sometimes not what I would have done. And Anyway, I, uh, in the process of praying about that one and grieving over it, um, he took me into this place of joy and he said, you're grieving because you're losing a friend and you're losing a, a, a very integral part, a key person in the body of Christ. Uh, that's an extraordinary wife, an amazing mother, a really good friend. Yeah. He said, but you should be rejoicing that from my right hand, there's things that she can do that she can't while she's on the earth. Even for her children, the desires of her heart for her children, she now is in a position to answer things that she wants for her children that she would have never seen if she had stayed on the earth. And so the, he said, you need to understand when somebody passes, they move into a place of, of judicial rule with me. So her household is actually gonna be in better shape in the days ahead because of the way she'll be communing with me from my throne. I say, yeah, I know, I believe you, but still hurts like crazy. And I still wish it could be my wife. <laughs> you know? And uh, well, then he said something funny to me and I didn't get it at first. He said, your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. And you don't even know how to pray fully yet. You're only praying with two thirds of, of what I've equipped you with. And I said, what am I missing now? And he said, well, you know how to pray and you know how, how to intercede, but you haven't learned how to supplicate. And so the scripture is with all prayers, intercession and supplication, make your requests known to God. And so I thought, I don't even know if I know what the word supplication means. <laughs> I, uh, I thought it was the same thing as prayer because I looked it up in Webster's one time. <laughs> and it is a form of prayer, but it's different from intercession. It's different from just spoken prayers. The word supplicate means to present your case before the king. Yeah. It's a legal term. It's something a lawyer knows how to do when they go to court. But most Christians don't know how to do it because we didn't know we could go to court. We thought we just went straight to Jesus. We didn't realize that sometimes we were going to go into the court of heaven. Now, this has all changed because a lot of the revelation of the courts of heaven, it's become such a widespread, uh, fascinating revelation that's rained down upon us that lots of people are figuring these things out. So, so I know for most of you, I'm not telling you anything yet you don't know. But I began to aggressively ask Jesus, teach me how to supplicate. And this is exactly what he did. He crossed his arms like this. He looked at me very lovingly and kindly. And he said, are you sure you want to learn how to supplicate? Because you know, I won't give you that wisdom without requiring you to, to apply it. 
I said, I know you well enough to know that, but I'm asking for the full the full bow. So if I'm only praying with two thirds of my effectual capability, I want the full bow to fill up. So teach me how to supplicate the way you do. And he said, fine, shut down your church. Now I thought I was gonna fix the lady that was in a coma. I didn't know that my church had to shut down. What does that have to do with having to supplicate? He said, if you wanna learn how to supplicate, you're gonna to have to learn how to, to build a, a proper foundation on my name. And right now I want to just tell you very clearly, you're out of constitution with me. You're not complying with my ways. You're not walking in my word. And your foundation for the for what you call my house is cracked, broken, and it is not aligned with me correctly. So I want you to shut the whole ministry down. And I thought, gee, that sounds like I'm in trouble. And I thought I was asking for help. <laughs> and, uh, so I said, what's wrong with the church? <laughs> it's the best, you know, now I, I, I can still say this. Uh, I thought it was the best church in town. <laughs> there was a, a lot of them in Oklahoma, but this one was the cream of the crop, according to many people, not just me. And I'm not saying that out of bias because I was a leader there. It, it really was a phenomenal group. But I said, what's wrong with it? And he said, it wasn't birthed correctly. And it's not, it's not, it's, it's, it's not all wrong, but you don't know how to separate what's precious from what's defiled. So I need you to put it all on the fire so I can help you reconstitute it. And he used that word. I want to reconstitute it so that it's in my name. And I really didn't know, yeah, I really didn't know how that worked. How does God constitute a church? I thought we were already incorporated and already legal and already, you know, in the name. And we're two or three gathered together, then he'll be in the midst of us. I was that was something I preached and thought. So I didn't understand that language. So I simply said, I'm willing to do whatever you require. Uh, I've learned this about Jesus. Uh, even if I don't understand it, I, he knows I'm going to tell him yes. Yeah. So uh, I said, I don't care what it costs. Uh, you got a yes out of me. Just help me. No. I'm not the only decision maker of this place either. So you're going to have to give me language that helps other people understand it. Because if I take this to the to the board, they're, they're going to say I'm crazy. You know, there's no reason to do it except you say so. So you're going to have to say this to everybody. He said, I'll do that. So he, we began to process this. Now, what we discovered is that we were incorporated originally in 1948. We had a, um, a legal 501c3. Um, even back then, it was a, that was an early, uh, that was the early application of a 501c3. They're very popular now, but we were one of the first ones to do it. And uh, I wasn't in the church back then. Uh, that happened when it was a Baptist church. And uh, it was connected to the Southern Baptist Convention at one point in that denomination. And then in the late 70s, uh, right before I joined it, they, they dropped out of the Baptist uh, constitution or the Baptist denomination, and they became a non-denominational church, but they kept their same incorporation. They just modified their bylaws. Well, that was the problem that they're, when they incorporated, they were incorporated with legal advice from the Baptist denomination and a family made a donation of the land and some of the materials for the building, and they had put a clause in the uh, deed that if it ever stopped being a Baptist church, that the whole property would revert back to that family or their heirs. You know? And we had stopped being a, pastor, uh, a Baptist church, and we had been operating without being a Baptist church for more than 20 years, and we were out of compliance with our own deed, with our own incorporation, and Jesus just simply said, I can't inhabit that because you're not in compliance even with your own document. Mm -hmm. And I realized the 501c3, the wording of it must be more important to Jesus than I thought. And just because we were legal, we weren't in compliance with the king. Mm -hmm. We certainly had, we had everything 
right with the state. We had everything right with our accounting. We were in good standing with IRS, but we were not in good standing with Jesus. And, and we didn't know that till we asked. And so I, I threw that in his face. I wasn't mad at him, but I just said, wait a minute, Jesus. You've done so many things here. You've come in. Your glory has appeared sometimes. You've done some phenomenal things. We've seen miracles. How can you say you won't inhabit this? He said, well, I'm not coming into your constitution or your incorporation. I'm coming into my people because I can't stand not being with them. So you're getting a mercy response from me. I show up because I can't stand not seeing my bride, you know, but I can't stay. I can't stand on your cracked foundation and I can't inhabit your house because it's yours, not mine. So you get a taste of my glory. You don't get my habitation. Mm -hmm. I said, well, all right. That makes me want to plow it up then. I'm going to, I became zealous. Like if, if you don't want it, then I don't want it. So I'm going to become zealous to get this done. And anyway, I don't want to go into a lot of detail over the, that whole process, but just trust me, we, we plowed it up. You know, we dissolved it. And then we reincorporated with a new, a new constitution and a new uh, incorporation. It's not a 501c3 now, but it's a new structure so that it could function legally and judiciously. And when we began to look at what is the difference between an incorporation and a constitution, um, I still felt like we fell short of the constitution. We, we talked about it, but we didn't know how to do it yet. So we did what we knew and we, we obeyed Jesus as much as we understood. And that church is thriving again now doing very well, but uh, it's not the same, it's the same location, it's not the same church anymore. Um, so uh, when I when I left there, I didn't leave there because I was frustrated or because I was upset with them. I, I love them, they still love me, but I, I left the church in my position because Jesus told me to resign from everything that gave me some identity or leadership in the body of Christ and put it all on the fire and then I could only take out of the fire what emerged that was approved by God. So I went through a radical transformation dealing with anything, identity, gifting, religious thinking that was in me for that whole decade. And this term constitution began to really stick in my spirit. So I, I went back to Jesus again and again, said, help me understand the difference between a constitution and an incorporation. He said, well, you actually know a lot about this already. If you'll just think about where you live, you know, do you, are you living in a country with the constitution? I said, yes, it's probably one of the best ones that exist among the secular world. He said, what did they have to go through to create that? I said, well, I know a large group of men had to sequester themselves and they, write, they had to think about every wording, every, every part of every sentence on the document and then when they signed it, they risked everything. They risked their very lives to, to complete it and ratify it. And then they still had to get the people to say, that's what we want. He said, why hasn't my body done that? I went, do we need to do that? <laughs> because <laughs> I thought we already had the word of God that we need something else. <laughs> And, uh, and I, I simply said, I, I, I believe the word of God is my constitution. Yeah. He said, well, you actually, you're actually right, but you also need to know how to apply it to something that you're going to ask other people to come and visit. Yeah. So he said, if you'll think more about how to write a constitution, you know, I want you to write one for my kingdom. Yeah. And if you'll do that, then I'll give you a little more wisdom on my ways and I'll give you a little more wisdom on uh, how I think judiciously, because if you'll listen to me on this deal, uh, you're going to cause my kingship to emerge in the earth with power because I'm waiting for my foundation to come into agreement on the earth as it is in heaven. So, so now you can come up in the heavenly realms and convene uh, in my presence with the court of heaven and you can get some justice things done. 
And I'm going to open that up for many, many people in the earth. But what I really want is for you to invite me into your city and give me the same access into your city and your nation and your household that I have given you to mine. And I realized that I had never been told no in heaven if I saw something I wanted to find out about or search out or, or ask questions, I would get an answer. If there was a door and it was closed, if I asked about it, uh, I could go over there and it would open. If I, if I asked Jesus about a particular topic, he would take me into a level of glory to show me those things. I realized that over and over and over for my entire life, Jesus has never denied me access to any part of his kingdom. So why isn't he inhabiting my city with the same level that he's allowed us to inhabit his? I would submit to you that it's not a move of God problem or it's not a future revival problem. It's a constitution problem. We're asking the king of kings to come in on secular foundations instead of creating a foundation that he's willing to walk on. The coals of his altar have to come down into our midst and change some things. So I realized that I've been trying to pray him into governments. I've been trying to pray him into churches. I've been trying to pray him into, into schools and businesses and, and neighborhoods. And I've not quite thought this way enough. So I sat down and I said, what would a constitution look like if I, if I gave more attention to that instead of just writing a good bylaws and, and 501c3 or legal document? He said, well, again, you got to go back and remember that I, I told you, you need to become a supplicator. So you're going to have to know how to present a case. And so here's what I want you to understand. First of all, right now, if you had not listened to me and dissolved that local church, you know, not too far down the road, you would have been facing a lawsuit that the church would have lost because you were out of compliance with your own incorporation. But because you listened to me, I spared the whole body there from that law. Because it wasn't a difficult thing. To, it, it was a little bit of work to fix, but it wasn't that difficult and hard to fix. It was a technical problem. When we, when I, just to give you an example of it, because of this little clause that the original donor had put in the deed, we had been out of compliance with that for 20 years. When we went to our attorney and said, how do we fix this? He said, you can't. You're going to have to go to the Baptist, Baptist denomination and give them their church back. Based on your deed, they own the building and the land. You ceased to own it the day you decided not to be a Baptist church. Well, okay, we can keep that secret and we can be out of compliance and we can be illegal and then we can call for the king of glory to come and inhabit it. Or we can follow the rules that were laid down in that constitution and let God show us how to fix it, which he did. Now, I went to the U.S. Constitution and I began to read it and I realized that this had to be inspired by God. I don't think common men can come up with stuff like this very easily. Uh, now, I'm not saying it's a perfect document, but I'm saying that uh, I, I do know that many of the people that were involved in writing that were praying men, and not all of them, but the ones that were praying were part of the mix. There was enough of them, I think, that they really kept that on track to end up with something that was pretty phenomenal. Still think it falls short of the glory of God, though. But I began to think of what would a constitution look like if we wrote a constitution for the king of kings, for the kingdom of heaven? Well, first of all, this has changed my premise of understanding because up to that point, I believed it was my job to get the king of glory to come into every aspect of my society. Yeah. So I'm protesting to the political system. I'm protesting to everything that's wrong at the judicial system. I'm at the school board asking them sometimes to make changes because it affects our kids. And I don't disagree with anyone that does those things if you're doing it with the right heart. However, that is not how the King of Kings wants to be brought in because we're, we're in essence bringing him in 
and sitting him in the room with us. And then we're appealing to someone that is beneath his kingship. And we're asking them to make a decision to let his, his word stand. Instead of let me lift up the king of glory, he will draw all men unto him and I will constitute the kingdom of heaven. And then all governments on the earth become subject to it. That makes a little more sense to me now. So I began asking him, how do I do it? I don't even feel qualified to do it. I'm not an attorney. Maybe I need a whole team of people globally to think about this. So I didn't move very fast, but I began to dialogue this with others. Um, so think about this now. When I read my 501c3, after we had finally made the decision to dissolve it, we only had uh, five scriptures that were a part of that incorporation. In our bylaws, we had listed those five scriptures as statements of faith. We believe this, we believe this, we believe this, we believe this. And when I looked at that, I thought, well, this is pretty good. These are some of my favorite scriptures, but it's certainly not the whole word of God. Yeah. It's just five verses. Yeah. Nowhere in our church document did we say that the entire word of God is what we believe. We actually incorporated a statement that only says we believe these five scriptures. Yeah. And when Jesus set me down as a king and he said, now look at that document, how have I endorsed it? I said, well, I don't think you've endorsed it at all. You told me you didn't like it. You wanted me to plow it up and dissolve it. He said, yes, but over the years that you've been there, how have you seen me move in the midst of that, even though it's flawed? I have done some miracles. I have done some things in the church. So what did I do? And I could, I could make a list of every miracle I had seen in 20 years. And I could tell you every miracle was in agreement with one of those five scriptures and none else. All the unanswered prayers were not in alignment with the wording of those five scriptures. But the things we had seen the power of God on was only relating to the things we had incorporated. And I said, Jesus, I see this clearly. You, you've honored what we wrote, but you have not always honored what you wrote because we didn't know how to apply it correctly. What do I miss here? He said, that's the difference in a constitution. I will only inhabit, if you put that out there and you tell everybody in the city that my name is on it, I will only inhabit what you constitute. He said, this is the flaw with many of the denominational churches and with many of the body, of, uh, the parts of the body of Christ is they have done exactly what you did. They have lifted up one part of my word that they like, and they have preached it and taught it and zealously applied it. And they've seen me move as a result of that. But then another part that they don't agree with, I don't do. Unless somebody rises up in the midst of them and calls for me to do that, and their faith sometimes will override it, but it usually causes a problem when that happens. And I don't like to plow up my church unless they want me to fix it. But I also won't inhabit or share my glory with what is not in agreement with my work. So, boy, I realize. Man, we have fallen short. That was the true definition for me of we have fallen short of the glory of God. Because we valued something for the state more than we valued something for heaven. So I said, all right, I don't want to make that mistake twice. So how should I word this? He said, well, why don't you just put a simple statement of faith that says you believe the entire word of God as written by my finger. I said, okay, I can do that. <laughs> That's simple. <laughs> now, all of you know, most of you that have hung out with Terry, you all know that when you've gone into the courts of heaven, if you have any experience with that, then you, you start thinking this way a little bit. Because every time we go into the courts of heaven, we learn a little bit about how Jesus is thinking judiciously. You know? And this has been eye-opening for me because I was I was preached over and over and over as a child growing up about the love of God and the shepherding of God and the pastoring heart of God and and you know the the fivefold ministry and 
and evangelism, but I really didn't have very many times that somebody sat me down and said, let me tell you about the character and nature of Jesus as a king. But I can tell you, he's very different as a king than he is when I only appeal to him as a savior. So let me give you an example in scripture. Have you ever noticed that in the book of Acts, when they were getting ready to move into what I'm talking about, where they were going from their, their three and a half years of discipleship into going into the upper room and being endued with power and having something structurally emerge now that God was going to call his body. Okay. And in that second chapter of Acts, we, we see from the resurrection to the act of praying until you're endued with power, they are incorporating the church. They're not incorporating it with a document that's filed at the state or with a document that had to be filed in Rome. They were incorporating it in the heavenly realms by doing what the king had instructed them to do and structure emerged from it as they obeyed what he said. And it was, it was endowed with his power and filled by his spirit. And even Terry and I talked about when we first met about a scripture that talks about the church of Jesus Christ that's recorded in the heavens. It, it actually is written in scripture that he records his house in the heavenly realms. If it's legitimate, but what if it's not legitimate? Hmm. Terry, you remember that verse off your head? I was looking for it. I think it's in Hebrews. I'll yeah, find it. Hebrews yeah, 11, you, you maybe. You might find that and post it because everybody needs to look at that. Um, okay, yeah. I should, have, I should have brought that out before we started, but it's really important because it, it gives us a sense that if we follow his ways and we incorporate correctly, then the deed, the legitimacy of his house is recorded in the heavenly realms. Now, I can record it in a secular courthouse. I don't see any problem with that. But if I only record it on the earth and I'm not registered in heaven, he doesn't have to inhabit it. So I've always given legitimacy to the body of Christ based on where two or three gather together in my name, then he has to be there. That's the way it was taught to me. But that's not what it says. It doesn't say that just because two or three of us get together that he has to show up. It says if two, two or three are in agreement with his name, his name means his presence. So if I come into his presence, then he will inhabit. But if I'm incorporating in my name and calling for the king of glory to come, he's not obligated to endorse what I'm doing. He, he might show up because he loves me, but he's not obligated. This is our problem with church. We, we think he's supposed to be there. So we're often praying for the king of glory to come and fill it with his power. And sometimes he doesn't want to because we didn't follow his ways. Now he wants to inhabit something for us, but he sees a difference between the incorporated structure and you. Also in the same way, you're a spirit, soul, and body, and you are his temple. So he wants you to put his word in your heart. And he says, I will write my word on your heart. I will write my name on your head or on your spirit. And that's constituting, that's putting a constitution on the foundation for him to inhabit. If I don't put his word in my heart, then I may not see him move within me to the level that's possible. But the more of his word that I begin to apply to my life, the more he inhabits. I become his temple by enlarging his presence, not by just believing in what he wrote, but by applying what he wrote to my living examples of life and he inhabits it. You know because I'm speaking the truth, I'm believing the truth, I'm living out the truth, so he inhabits it, and he evidences it with signs, wonders, miracles, power, he puts his name on it. You know? So if we're not seeing that, it's not necessarily because he doesn't want to show up, or because he hasn't flipped the switch for revival yet, we may not be seeing it because we didn't put the foundation together correctly, and we didn't create something that he wants to inhabit. So we should at least take my whole being, 
and start here. The, it is the house. This is the house. So first, let's start with me. How do I how do I make a constitution with God? You know. Well, that's what Abraham had to understand because he was brought into covenant. He had to come into an agreement with God and apply it and then walk it out. You know. First, it was Abraham. Then it was. Abraham and Sarah and his house, and then it began to apply to everyone in his household. Eventually, he gets a second layer of that, and it's extended to his descendants that are going to become like the stars of heaven and the sand upon the seashore. So God makes a covenant with Abraham, gives him a blessing for all the nations of the earth. That's a pretty good constitution. Now, we end up with some written document but we don't end up with a written document saying, here's what the covenant is. We end up with a story with a life that's lived as an example, with him listing out in the scriptures all the encounters that he had with God and how God engaged with him and what God said. And that became a part of the word of God that came down to us. Now, I don't want to discredit that. And I don't want anybody to think that I'm saying we don't need the word of God. The written word of God is the most precious possession that I have besides Jesus himself. And they're the same. I can't separate them anymore. But if I'm going to write a constitution, I need to think about it in the same way as covenant was written in scripture. Now, I'll submit this to you just as a thought. When Abraham received the covenant, it came with a face to face with God. I would say that's a pretty good way to validate it. It's like Father God put his stamp on it by showing up. <laughs> yeah. However, the promise of the blessing coming to all the nations comes by him writing it into the word of God and then preserving it to come down through the generations so that we have it now in our hands where we can read Abraham's story and we can read his covenant. You know? It's a living document because it became a part of the word of God. And when I want to apply the same thing, when I want to come into covenant with God in my day, I need to ask Jesus into my heart. And then the word of God comes into my heart and it begins to come alive within me. So the constitution that's going to be written is not just Genesis to Revelation, but it's how he applies his word to his perfect will for my life. My story becomes a constitution. My testimony becomes a constitution. That's why he said, by the word of your testimony and the blood of the lamb, they shall overcome. You know? Well, what are they overcoming? They're overcoming anything that falls short of his glory. Mm -hmm. But I can take it one step further in the same way that Abraham applied covenant to his, to his household and brought the living God into his tent. And then he wrote his story, and we end up with the Torah. You know? Moses did the same thing. Uh, we end up with the, the scriptures coming down. So we got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and it's telling us the Constitution. Okay? Because it relates more to how he did covenant with those that said yes to him than it does with just a history lesson. If you, I hope that makes sense. Now, as I apply the Torah, meaning those first five books, as I begin to apply them to me, I have to learn how to come into covenant, and I have to learn how to apply his word to my house, to myself and to my house. So I believe that we're supposed to constitute this on three levels. One is I need a constitution for me. I need a life statement that I could put into words that says, here is my, my will and testament of God's presence in my life. Yeah. I'm going to leave this document for my children and my children's children, not just to tell them how to divide up my stuff, but I'm going to testify to my face-to-face -to -face and to the glory that I've had with the living God. And I'm going to leave a foundation for them with my blessing so that they can step into it too, since they're my heir. You know, 
they're not just going to inherit my house. They're going to inherit my constitution with God. Yeah. Because I prayed numbers eight over them. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you, lifting up his countenance upon you. May he give you peace as he gave me peace. And when I write that scripture upon their head, when I speak that blessing over them, he will sure, he says, he will write his name on them and he will surely bless them. You know, that means they can inherit my covenant. Yeah. This is why when Jesus showed up to Isaac for the first time, he introduces himself as the God of your father. Yeah. He doesn't say I'm Jehovah Jireh, or he doesn't say I'm I'm the Lord El Shaddai. He doesn't he doesn't he he reveals many names later, but when he comes to Isaac for the first time, the face to face, he says, "I am the God of your father." I'm now here to uphold the constitution that you have inherited. And it's not a document that your dad gave you to read. I'm the document. <laughs> so if you want me, you want to walk in my blessing, let's have let's develop a friendship. You know. He does the same thing with Jacob. He's still doing it. <laughs> now the written part of it though. I first have to let him write stuff on my heart. So he writes his constitution on my heart. He, he puts the terms of his covenant on my spirit. Yeah. He makes it known to me. I say yes to it. We begin walking it out. Now I might need to go one step further and make that visible for others so they can understand how to transact business with me or, or come into friendship with me or marry me, or have a covenant with me also. Because if you understand I'm in covenant with God, you might not want to be in covenant with me, yeah. unless you're a friend to God. Yeah. <laughs> because my covenant is going to war with someone that is not honoring my king. Yeah. Not because I don't like them, but because my constitution is speaking, it has power with God, to transform the atmosphere and, and the earth everywhere I go. So I'm bringing the foundation of heaven everywhere I go if I understand how to walk this out. When I put it in writing, I need to be very careful that I'm codifying with words something that somebody else can link with scripture and understand. And I don't want to think about that lightly because I don't want it to fall short of the full benefit. You know? So I don't want to just say, oh, I believe this about God instead of I believe everything God says. Mm -hmm. Now, if I apply that correctly to me, then I learn how to apply it to my household. So now my entire household begins to walk into the benefits of covenant. Everyone related to me comes under the blessing. And we begin to transform the family name, begins to transform the earth with the, with the name above every name. Mm -hmm. So my family begins to transact business in the earth for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. That's going to turn into all kinds of covenants and agreements and documents and witty inventions and businesses and whatever he applies our gifts and graces to. But then I can go one step further, which is what we really want to figure out how to do. And that's how to write a constitution for the kingdom of God itself, and then pray that into our city, pray that into the land that he gives us stewardship over, so that it becomes the founding document of his glory in that area, instead of something secular that might or might not open the door to him. Yeah. This is why I lift up your heads, O ye gates, is so important. I'm the gate that needs to open up and let the king of glory in. I really don't have to, now it's respectful, so I'm not saying to be mean to secular things, but I don't have to go to the political system and say, I wish you guys would repent and start acting like God wants so we can have a revival. No, I just bring the glory and I bring the constitution to fullness. I declare it over the land and then they have to choose to comply or not. If they comply, it will go well with them. 
if they say no to the king of glory, he's going to make some decisions. This is how the kingdom of God comes. And uh, now the, let me get a little technical here. In the same way that we had founding fathers took a great amount of time and effort to write a written constitution, they, were, they knew they were creating a government and they knew they were disengaging from a secular king who would not honor the, the, inalienable, the inalienable rights that God had given to all men. Do you think we have that same problem today in most nations? I would say yes. Even this one, America, is falling gravely short in the same way my church was falling gravely short of what God wanted for his house. The, our country is now falling short gravely of what we have actually written in our Constitution. If all we did was ask Jesus to uphold our Constitution, we would see massive transformation come to America. So I need to learn how to supplicate. I've got to learn how to present this case like a good lawyer to the judge so that he'll make a decision that agrees with what is written. Yeah. When I looked at that then, I need to put the King of Glory's name in the document. Uh, I don't think it's a valid constitution if I don't honor the King of Kings. The United States didn't do that. We wrote a good constitution and we said one nation under God, we didn't say which God. That's a technical flaw. So right now we try to serve many gods and that gets us in trouble with Jesus. I'm not going to fix that yet. I want to instead supersede that by say, let's just set that on the side for a little bit. We'll deal with that later. We'll deal with them out of kindness and love and respect after we have seen the King of glory begin to manifest. So let's go into the King's throne instead of the, the uh, capital of the U.S., and let's ask the king to show us how to write something that we can we can lay before him and say, will you inhabit this on the earth as it is in heaven? You know, he is the word that is constituted in heaven. So can I lift up Jesus in some way with a written constitution that says I'm declaring the king of kings? over this spot on the earth the way he truly is and i'm giving him full freedom in my constitution to do everything that is in his nature and in his power the door is wide open and it will never be shut because i'm i'm declaring it so now will he honor that i don't know unless i give it some real careful thought and ask his wisdom along the way it needs to be done but I also think we can't take this lightly. So uh, here's what I've come up with so far. Wording is very important, but in most constitutions around the world, there is a what they call a pre preamble or a enabling clause. It's a declaration that says we have the right to exist. Yeah. So we had to do that. We had to have a declaration of independence to disengage from a secular kingdom called England so that we could then constitute a new nation and ask God to endorse it. Mm -hmm. We didn't ask the king of England's permission to endorse it. We made a declaration that disengaged from his kingdom. And then we submitted to God to watch over and protect the one that we were creating. It was dangerous, it took us to war. In the end though, the King of England came into agreement with what God endorsed. And I don't think God endorsed the United States because it was a perfect uh, creation. I think it was because we were stepping closer to honoring his name and honoring the inalienable rights that he had given to all men. So if there is a value in having a kingdom with a secular king, how much more so would there be value in the earth to have a kingdom with the king of kings as the declared 
head. Now, I want to finish with one thing. Uh, this has been an emerging process for me. Uh, like I said, it started in the 90s. I've not moved very fast. But I now am in some level of relationship with seven different people groups in the earth that are in the process of rewriting their constitution for their nation. And they want to put the king of kings in their document. It's quite extraordinary to think about. So far, they're all native nations, native people groups. But I have found a couple of things interesting in history. Um, the early church really thought about this problem. And in the first hundred years, some of the letters that went back and forth among the churches and from the early apostles, we've got those because it's called the New Testament. But there are some documents that went back and forth that didn't end up being put into the biblical record. So, but they understood some things about the kingdom of heaven that we're still trying to figure out. They really understood how God dealt with Rome. They understood how he dealt with Israel when, when, when those in Israel that said no to him. And many of the priests got saved after the resurrection. So God was extraordinarily merciful to both of those nations as his house was emerging in the earth. He's not an angry God. So when a secular world is out of compliance with him, he doesn't just go blow them up. He raises up his house and then he lets the transformation that comes with his power and glory shake the, the, the structures of the heavens and the earth. So everything that falls short of his glory gets shook. And when it gets shook, it has every opportunity possible to repent and come into his glory. If they, if they decide no, they usually cease to exist. But then something strange happened. And uh, after about 100 years of the early church spreading the gospel throughout the world, uh, Constantine rose up. And he murdered the apostolic churches the same way other kings and governments had murdered most of the apostles. He purposely dissolved the churches that had been birthed by the apostles. And then he recreated churches underneath his kingship. I would submit to you that that was a coup to bring to an end the kingdom of heaven on the earth. And it was successful in part because most of the body of Christ submitted to it. And ever since then, most of our churches have been birthed under that perspective, thinking that it's legitimate for me to go to the state and incorporate the house of God and get their permission to exist. Even though it's not a king in the United States, what's the difference? Do I really need the state to put a stamp of approval on my incorporation so the king of glory can come? Doesn't that make the king of glory subject to a secular government that does not want to honor him? I'm not saying that to be negative about that government. They do what they do, and they still do many good things in their existence, but they're not designed to be the kingdom of heaven. But I have lied to myself when I believe that that's okay with the king of kings, that he doesn't need to have his own constitution and his own kingdom to inhabit. I, it's wrong of us, I believe, to make him submit to something in the state just so we can call it church. But if we do it correctly, it, it does cause some shaking. So um, in history, the Cherokee Nation in the early 1800s, about 1817, they began having a revival. A couple of missionaries went into the midst of them, began to teach them the kingdom of God and taught them of the love of God. And most, uh, about 97, 98% of the members of the tribe in that day got saved and they began to transform greatly. They became the first so-called civilized tribe, even though I wouldn't call them savages before, but they became civilized in the sense that they began to think more about 
uh, community structure that was similar to the West, because Christianity transformed them so much, they began to look at the word of God for how this should be, how community should be done. And they did very well. And then about 1821, they decided that they needed a new constitution for their government. And they sought out the two missionaries and they wanted to write a constitution like the United States, but they wanted to put Jesus's name in there because he had become the principal chief of the Cherokee nation. Right after they accomplished that, they actually wrote, wrote it and began to go through the process of ratifying it among their tribes and their, their clans. And then suddenly they were called savages again. Gold was discovered on their land and they were taken over and run out of Georgia. And we ended up with the Trail of Tears and that document was law by the time they got to the state of Oklahoma, they were so devastated in heart. Uh, thousands of them had died in the adversity of the Trail of Tears. And so they ended up being forced by the United States government into a, a compromised government that included members of the tribe that were already in present day Arkansas and Oklahoma and all the ones that were on the Trail of Tears and the Cherokee nation that exists today was not the incorporation that they had done as Christians giving the king of kings their nation. Yeah. In my opinion, I believe pretty, pretty well and say pretty boldly that the king of kings told me that that was a nation that he was birthing on the earth as a first fruit and his constitution among the Cherokee was martyred in order for us to have a reservation instead of the kingdom of heaven. When I say us, I mean the United States, not, not us. The next time something similar happened was the state of, was in Hawaii. Uh, revival moved in Hawaii. Many of the Hawaiians got saved. The last king of, uh, the last king of Hawaii was really struggling in his heart. He abdicated most of his power to his sister. So the last queen of Hawaii, very honorable, godly woman, she decided that she needed to write a constitution for the Hawaiian nation. And she transferred her power and royalty. The kingdom of Hawaii was transferred into the kingdom of heaven. And she wrote Jesus into a new constitution. Literally days later, after that was declared, the US Navy rode into the harbor and took over that country. And it's now the 50th state of the United States, but the kingdom of Hawaii ceased to exist. And I struggle with this because I wonder why the nation that was raised up in the earth that declares freedom for all men and upholding the inalienable rights that are gifted to all of us as human beings by the living God. Why would we destroy in two examples, an emerging kingdom that was declaring the King of Kings their King? I think it's because there's still a religious spirit in America that is warring with the kingdom of heaven. And even though we're probably the greatest country on the earth and the constitution that we have is probably the best well-written constitution among nations, it still falls short of the king of glory, and it still falls short of what he would write as a king. And we're, 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 we hold on to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil more than the tree of life. But I believe God is ready to do this on a massive scale, and he's calling for his body to move into uh, a new level of thinking and wisdom so that we apply the power of God to a constitution that defines the kingdom of heaven as it is above, so let it be on the earth. I'm not saying that we create a, a revolutionary movement. I'm, I'm not saying that we go to war against all the nations. It's, it's a war with our secular self. It's a war with carnality, not a war with the nations. I have to transform by becoming more Christ-like. And when we do that, he inhabits it. His habitation on the earth 
will cause mass movement of, uh, of his power and his glory. That's gonna shake the nations, but I don't have to tell them that they're wrong. I just have to demonstrate what the king's willing to do and give them an opportunity to let him be a part of it. It is absolutely clear in scripture that all the nations of the earth will bow their knee to him. Some way, somehow, that's going to happen. I think we accelerate that towards the day if we will do this particular thing well. Yeah. So I would submit to you that we need to pray and we need to get some very, some very clear answers from God. I would like to uh, consider at some point in the very near future uh, convening something like a constitutional convention where we call for people to come from different parts of the world and sit down and pray and ask the king how he would like to incorporate his kingdom. And then write something, not saying it might be final in one meeting, but we write something like what the early founding fathers did for the United States government. We come out with something to decree and declare that says this is what the king wants. And now we're going to bring our, our lives, our households, and and our influence into compliance with it. The boundaries don't have to be in the same way as we do secular boundaries because he's the king of the heavens and the earth. So I think the wording is more important than the territory. Uh, that may change later, but for right now, I'm not thinking about specific boundaries for a country. I'm thinking about how to word it so that it's in complete agreement with the word of God but I'm lifting up the king of glory. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. I think this is how we're supposed to do that. Yeah. Hope that makes sense. So I'll stop there and open it up for other comments or questions. Yeah, wow, thank you. That's like, <laughs> how many of your mindset just totally radically changed and looking at everything? I just want to go back. I, I think you mentioned something earlier that, that uh, it all has to start with us individually, right? And I believe as we begin to do that now, when we come to this place where we all come together to to write this this uh, governing document, it, it will it will uh, will have more uh, effect. But I want to share an encounter I had with the Lord a couple years ago that applies to here. We actually did a, a broadcast on it before. Uh, what happened in the encounter, I was seeking the Lord, don't remember what for, but I began to see all these scrolls coming out of out of heaven. And, you know, I thought, oh, wow, this is pretty cool. And But uh, they had such a negative tone to them, a frequency, a negative frequency to them, that I said, uh, this is not what, I, what it appears to be. So what I began to seek the Lord on was the revelation of what they're about and what, what he said. He said, Terry, these are, are constitutions. They are governing laws that you have created out of your false perceptions. Mm -hmm. And so I had to deal with each and every one of them. This is what became a court case for me, that I had to deal with each and every one of them. And as I dealt with them in the courts, uh, a lot of them were, I was my own accuser. Uh, the mindsets, I believe, my belief systems, my faith, so be it unto you according to what you believe in. And so a lot of those things are out of, out of, out of context of his constitution. So each one I began to pray and, and uh, repent of, even the ones he showed me, I had no earthly knowledge of doing that, but they were generational bloodline iniquity issues. And so I, I learned a lot. So this is what really interests me and what you're, we're talking about. And you mentioned another, another thing that I thought was, uh, was very powerful. We talked about it before. It was a revelation the Lord gave me. He says, when we make a declaration, it becomes a governing law for good or bad, either way, in the land, in our land whether it's our body, whether it's our family, and up from there. It's shown at two times in the Word, Isaiah 2, 3, and Micah 4, 2. My people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, 
he will teach us his ways. He will, we, and we shall walk in his paths, and out of Zion shall go forth the law. Now this was, this was after the, the, uh, the Moses on the mountaintop. This was after the law was written in the Torah. And so what is that? Out of the law, this is the governing law that he creates it as a co-creator, uh, or if we're in partnership with the enemy, we're co-creating with either or and releasing these governmental decrees and they've become constitutions in our life. So we have to begin to break those, ask the Lord to begin to, uh, that's why I love Psalms 139, 23 and 24 so much, says, search me, O God, see if there's any wicked way in me. We don't know all those things, but it's, but it's, uh, it's been such a freeing uh, process that I've been embracing uh, uh, along the way that I know there's some place he's taken me that I honor, begin to honor him in a much greater way, even the things that are happening in my body as a, as a sign and in the, in my life where the whole foundation of my condo was ripped out and, and jacked up all the support systems and beams and my floor was messed up and they had to replace my floor and, and all that was just saying to me that God was restructuring the very foundation of everything we stand upon. Where we live, God is restructuring, uh, rewriting the constitutions of everything about us, and so this really, I love that uh, the the exact same scripture is said again in Micah four two, and so really, it's been a a process where I've been more sensitive, uh, more attentive to the words that I speak, uh, the what what's in my heart, the mindsets my actions, uh, what I believe, uh, and all those things that are constitutional that may not be in line with his constitution. So I really love what, what, you're, what you're doing. I, I wanted to facilitate uh, this uh, process that uh, we'll get the right people together uh, uh, and we'll, we'll become will come together at some point and begin the process. If anybody has a heart or desire or a mandate from the Lord for do this, uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch. Just contact Timothy or me and, and we'll all, all uh, 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 work this thing together. I saw Tony, your friend, was here earlier uh, and left earlier, but uh, I think it's a wonderful thing. It's really just, uh, I began to see, I look at things, what, uh, I look at me first all the time, and I begin to say, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, where are all these constitutions that I've written that are ungodly that don't, don't, are, are, aren't even anything close to what his constitution is. So yeah. my light bulbs were going off all the way through <laughs> what you had to say. I don't know about yours, but mine, mine sure were. So let's just, I hope y'all don't, I hope y'all don't mind me. Uh, you know, up, I was hungry. <laughs> yeah, let's oh, just yeah, open no. it up for uh, Donald is here, Levita, uh, anybody else? Let's open it up for a little conversation. Yeah, I just want to say that I do remember when you started working on this. It was at the same time that we met in Springfield uh, when you uh, were quoting and relying on uh, what Gary, what's his name, Gary Beaton. Right. Yeah, when, what he had started working on with regard to uh, the writing of a, a new constitution. I, I you, you shared a copy of the work you had done uh, in studying uh, his work. And I, I definitely do remember that. So this, um, while Timothy was still talking, I, I put in the chat room here that I did search Trail of Tears and it, there's a wealth of knowledge there uh, the maps of um, all the states that were impacted. And so I am interested. I just don't know, you know, how much time we all would be required to devote to it, but I'm definitely interested. And we are having Q&A, right? That's, that was yeah. Donna's question. Sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, let, let me say something about Gary. I, he and I began working on this independently. We didn't have a conversation uh, and then go do it. Um, and, and what he's written 
I, I've done the same and then sort of scrapped it and rewrote it. And I'm, I think the same thing happened in the Constitutional Convention of the United States, that, that they didn't rush it. They took some time, but they sort of shut down everything and gave themselves to that. And it was still months in the process. It's a real wisdom. Um, but I, I don't think Gary and I are the only ones talking about it either. I think whenever God starts doing stuff like this, he always raises up anybody that's listening. Exactly. So I, I, I do want to honor him, but I also want to say, I don't know who the first one was that came up with this idea. It probably goes back hundreds of years. Uh, I just think that we're, we're late to the party because the king's the king and the kingdom is at hand. You know? Yes. And we needed to we need to have this accomplished for the zeal of God, especially Father, to inhabit it so that He can give to Jesus what He promised to give Him on the earth as well as what's promised in the heavenly realms. Amen. And, uh, but anybody that that uh, runs into someone else like Gary or anybody that has a, something that you cross paths with, let me know and let's start sharing that stuff because. I'm convinced there's probably dozens of people out there that have written something similar to what Gary has, and we haven't we haven't all talked. You know, that's why I think it's time to bring all these pieces together, if possible, and then accelerate this work. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, Don, I know you wanted to uh, share something and ask a question. What's what's going on with you? Good to see you. Hi, Terry. Timothy, it's a pleasure to meet to meet you on screen. Hi, Don. Your your face and your person has been on my mind as someone I need to meet as I've recently moved to Oklahoma City. Okay. Well, I'm just down the street somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So perhaps we can connect sometime. That'd be great. I'm in War Acres area. Right? Okay. I'm I'm out by County Line, Northwest Oklahoma City. You're yeah, not far then. I'm close to Rockwell. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, a question, not really a question. I apologize if some of my pretend questions actually just are thoughts that i'm throwing out there but there's no there's, there's no there's no uh elementary questions in heaven <laughs> <laughs> um i i just i'm sitting here just with you know light bulb after light bulb going off and being very appreciative of the language that you're bringing to the content and um i i just appreciated the the phrase you used a little bit back where you said um, our constitution was made by men who did not define who God was and that that was a technical issue. And the more I peer into that technical issue, the more I see why we have reaped today's events. And I'm just curious if you had any more thoughts about that in particular, if um, just in particular around the, the, the topic of these men were deists, they, a lot of them were Freemasons. A lot of them knew exactly who they meant as God, but didn't write it because of the, um, the double meaning behind a lot of what they were involved with. Well, um, you know, if you did a real study of all of the founding fathers, you find some really wonderful things and some troubling things in many of them. Um, they weren't perfect men, but then that's true of everyone in history that God has ever used, you know, mm -hmm. um, wh where they start and where they end up with God is all, often two different things. Um, you know, Abraham came from, a, from Chaldea. His father was an idolater. Uh, he grew up in a culture that was full of idolatry, and he had to come into a revelation of the living God by a face to face, you know. And in order to really get that, he had to get out of the place he was in so he could actually have that and be able to process it and comprehend it without somebody else saying that's not right. You know? um, so I, history doesn't always do that justice. We don't know where every one of those guys' hearts ended up in the process of their journey with God. You know, we just know bits and pieces that gets documented in history. But I've I lean towards when God's doing something sovereign, He uses flawed uh, human beings. And I give them much more credit than history does because God got something done he wanted done 
and they didn't say no to it, you know, but the technical flaws are still important. Maybe they put that in there on purpose. I don't know. I've never read anything that said that they did that to dishonor Jesus. It was more, we probably can't get this ratified if we don't make this language that anybody can comply with, you know. I, I know they fell short on the slavery issue, you know. They should have, they, they declared all men equal, but then they didn't uphold that fully. We ended up not fixing that problem until the 60s, you know. And even today, we're still working on some of that. You know? But there's also some very flawed history that I have found when I've read the early history books and said that some of them are deists, a lot of them are Masons. Um, I, I went specifically to look at George Washington because he was our first president. I was looking at precedent like, well, if God wanted to honor the Constitution, what was he doing with George Washington? Because he let him become the first president, you know. And if this was one nation under God and God was helping them, then that that was setting some precedent, you know. Um, so I wanted to see what he actually thought. And I found a lot of stuff that said he was a Mason. I also found his own papers denies that his own letters actually rebukes one of the Masonic lodges for using his name. And the painting that shows him, you know, that is really idolatrous with the apron and all that stuff, they, uh, I don't think he agreed with that. Um, I do think he was a member of the lodge, but I don't think he understood it fully. It was part of his uh, military um, relationships while he was uh, young. And when he began to understand what they were doing, he resigned from the lodge. His letters prove it. And then he rebuked them later with another letter for using his name in a way that he was not in agreement with. And I think they did it anyway. I think they painted pictures and put up monuments and things to try to take his name into masonry on a level that he never came into full agreement with. That may be true of the other ones that are accused of being deists also. The exception to that rule that I've searched out personally was Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin had some real troubling things about his personality and beliefs, and he made no bones about them. But he was also a praying man, too. And so he, somewhere in there, he was conflicted in how he was searching out his own faith and trying to apply it. And so, again, I default back to this idea that when God uses men, they're always flawed when they start. And then the closer they get to letting him do what he wanted to do and then calling out searching for him, they probably end up at his right hand at some point because they let him use them, you know, and uh, and so I, I think that all of those guys probably ended up with some kind of encounter with God along the way, um, and that he probably honored that uh, in a way to reveal himself uh, before the end of their life. But can't say that that means they were all saved. Um, but then I go back to the document itself. Well, if flawed, flawed men create flawed documents. So there's always the case, even in myself, I realize that I could do my absolute best effort I could put all the wisdom I've learned from God for 60 years and still end up with something that falls short of his glory because just a human being, I don't know everything about the king yet. You know, that's why we have an, an eternity to, to enjoy mm -hmm. our fellowship with him. I'm going to be asking questions in 10,000 years that I don't even know to ask today. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. However, I look at it as... Um, I'm not looking for a perfect document. I'm looking for what will God say I will inhabit? You know, uh -huh. what I will was, he, I, I want him to come into the process, say, now I'm going to reveal myself, you know, mm -hmm. now I'm going to make my name known. And I want to give him, you know, something as a gift that he can stand on that says, this is holy enough for me to stand on. And now I will reveal myself, you know. And he'll take it from there and finish it with his word. And I think even the word of God is going to explode with wisdom that we've not seen in it yet. You know, it's there. We just don't know it's there because we've never we've never seen it, noticed it or preached it. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I and the book of Revelation is a good example. It, the word of God says it's sealed until the time. You know, why do I need to have a prophecy in the news or a prophecy 
you know, format to tell you everything I know about the book of Revelation, and, and unless I'm admitting that it's not sealed. <laughs> and uh, so if it's sealed, at some point it's going to get unsealed. And when it gets unsealed, we're going to discover things that God wanted us to know that we didn't, we don't know now. And so I think everything written already by God falls into that category that on some level we have seen in part and we've preached in part, and we've lived it in part. And yet it's still been glorious. You know? So as we go deeper with our relationship with God and the kingdom of God begins to emerge more on the earth, the, the written word of God is going to explode with new understanding and new wisdom and new applications and, and evidential power that we will see applied by his presence. You know? um, anyway, I'm not troubled by the, the founding fathers as I was in my youth. I was very troubled by some of those things. Uh, when I was a teenager, because I thought, well, gosh, if this was a nation under God, then th some of these guys were real rascals, you know. <laughs> but I'm okay with it because uh, God still uses flawed men. Even kings of the earth didn't know, don't know him. Uh, you know, we've got several examples of scripture where he reveals himself to Pharaoh. He reveals himself to uh, to um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, to Belteshazzar, you know, he, to the, to Pharaoh. He makes himself known when it's when it upholds his purposes, you know, and when those kinds of men had a dream or had an encounter with God, their response, even though they did a lot of dastardly things in their day, their response to that merited enough with God to put it into his word. You know? So I have a lot of faith that God's going to move on our behalf and it's not up to us to fix all this it's up to his glory you know? so, well I, I know you won't ask a question so let me toss it back to you if you got any more to say uh, <laughs> I, I i get carried away with george washington though because i i fell in love with the man when i searched out his history because uh mm -hmm. he does he has a lot of honor uh in the written history too but it it bothers me that some of our some of our forefathers stole his glory stole his honor you know used his name wrongly you usurped him in a way that he was not in agreement with mm -hmm. and that's still very much a part of our written history that our kids learn you know mm -hmm. And it's it's wrong. It's, it dishonored the man in ways that were not right. I'd like to set that right. You know, mm -hmm. I I feel like um, the grace of God for the individuals that were the founding fathers was certainly there for us as a nation collectively. And I know there's a lot of regret. Uh, they were men of their times also. And so it, we have to remember that and consider right. that. Um, I think more in terms of um, releasing grace to those men, but seeking, I just have this uh, terrier dog-like desire to undo what Satan would have twisted in their written document right. um knowing that the secret societies many of them were part of were those societies were built on the double entendre you know say mm -hmm. this but mean this right. and when it comes to the heart what did they write that we read it this way but they were writing from it whether they were deceived or not and perhaps many were um but how they wrote it from their heart. And how does that stand in the court of heaven? How does that document stand there? What can the heirs of Christ do today, um, to use your language, to um, bring about a court case that would engender the grace of God to, to give us a change in, in, in so that God could inhabit the nation as he wants? It's a great question because, um, first of all, I, I think masonry probably has been one of the greatest uh, undermining uh, efforts that the, the enemies of God has used. And because uh, there are oaths taken and there are 
are sacrifices made and there are things attached to the land, it's probably been the most damaging scheme that has warred with uh, God's purposes on the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and yet in masonry, there's still a lot of people that think they're doing good things and they're, and they're, they're not bad people if you just sit down with them individually. Uh, most of them, when they take their oaths, they're totally deceived. They don't think that it's a bad thing until they, well, by the time they discover it's a bad thing, they're too far into it to get out of it without damaging their their Very future nice house. You know? And so, uh, you know, I talked to one man a long time ago that used to be the, the top masonry, uh, I forget why I call him the Grand Wizard or whatever. He was the Grand Mason over uh, Montana at one time. And and he said to me what he had discovered after 30 years of masonry, I don't, he was way up there on the degrees. I don't remember the exact one, but he was above a 33rd degree. And he had to renounce everything. He had to go through about eight different sessions of deliverance. It was pretty weighty. And everyone in his household got sick when he got out of masonry. I mean, they got, you know, really sick with stuff and then, uh, and, and he said that he had discovered that uh, most of the Masons back in the 40s or 50s, they started building hospitals because all the oaths that they took that said, if you if you ever break this oath, these curses will come upon your family. He said they came upon their families anyway. So that's why they had to build hospitals. And yet by that time, they discovered that they're too far in. They don't know how to get out. And um, it's like a fear and terror because they they discover at one point that they've probably been enemies to God and then they, they don't think he'll forgive them. And at the same time, they think if they break their oaths or, or rebel against it, then it's even worse. But they're actually following rules that I think God established in the sense that we see in scripture guys building an altar and and honoring God with, you know, Abraham built one, Isaac built one, Jacob built one, but they didn't sacrifice a human being on it. You know, uh, they weren't defiled altars. They were something to memorialize or honor God. And yet we also see idolatrous or, you know, people doing that same thing. The, the premise of that means that something gets attached to the land and, and it lifts up whatever I lifted up. Mm -hmm. I can lift up the living God or I can lift up something else and that somehow gets attached to the land. You know? Then they put monuments on buildings and they put you know, certain things in certain places. So uh, I've been following that for a long time, trying to understand what do we do about this? You know, uh, how do we unravel this? And it's not all bad, so what's good? I don't wanna, I don't wanna you know, blow up a nice person just because I think they're doing something they shouldn't be doing, but I wanna deliver them from that. You know? mm -hmm. At the same time, I don't wanna lodge in my city and I don't think it's necessary to make a great city. So it may actually be counterproductive to the kingdom of God. But I think a lot of churches are actually the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's a, it took me a long time to be able to say that, but I do think that the primary premise in history, whether it's Masons or whether it's foreign gods or idols or all the stuff that we see mentioned in scripture that God was against, the primary common denominator in all of them is they lift up something that's counter to God. They don't lift up his name and they empower that with something religious instead of something spiritual and life-giving. You know? So a religious spirit is probably the, the, the biggest monster we need to deal with in the body of Christ. And we don't know we need to deal with it because it's usually good. You know? It usually comes to us looking good, leads us to do good things. You know? If you even think about the very first sin, Adam and Eve didn't sin by eating the evil fruit. They ate the good fruit. You know? But they ate from the wrong tree. You know? And so all the things that we do in church that has been good, but not God, or has been something he didn't lead us to do, we're supposed to do some good things. So I'm not saying it's always bad, but but if, if God didn't lead us to do something and we just think that it's important and we're doing it for God instead of doing it with God, 
then that may actually be doing on the land the same kind of thing the Masons are doing with intention and purpose to keep him from inhabiting it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm doing something for God's glory and they're doing something evil. And God looks down on it. He says, you guys are both idolatrous. You're both doing the same thing. You're both prohibiting me from being with my people. Yeah. And I mean, a church that says to the Holy Spirit, you can't come in here. How is that not idolatry? Mm -hmm. I, I, I no longer want to call a Mason Lodge bad and call a church okay when both of them won't let Jesus in. Yeah. Or the spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, yet I'm not against church at all. I, I'm uh, absolutely, I, I'll die for the house of God if I need to. I, I, I love the body of Christ and I love the house of God. I don't want to be ever be misinterpreted thinking that I'm negative about church. I'm negative about what keeps Jesus out. Mm -hmm. And in history, the religious systems, uh, even ones that claim to be under God, were often in trouble when he shows up. You know, we see that in when Jesus is alive, for sure. You know? mm -hmm. um, however, I take great hope in God has been greatly patient with us, and he's bringing us now to a place where he wants us to, to this is like the Constitution to me, is I would describe it in one way from heaven, it should be the foundation of his house. But I also believe it's like the icing on the cake of the party, the wedding feast that he's wanting to have. So he, he starts with something like a first fruit and then he finishes with it, you know? And so I think we're at this place where he's raising up a zeal to do this, not because it's finally gonna get us on the right track, but because it's gonna become like icing on his on the word of God. And it's going to, to release a party in the heavens for God's glory to begin to invade the earth. And it's lifting, again, the premise of it to me is not all the details of it, even though it's important. It's lifting up Jesus. If, if I be lifted up, then I will draw all men unto me. We've got to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, let me go back one real quick. One thing. You're, you're absolutely nailing something very important because the little details, the little flaws that guys did something with intentions to do something good and then they they compromise just a tiny bit and it looks okay because it still says God. <laughs> it, it, they, it's justifiable in their day because um, they thought they, they thought they did it right. You know? Or maybe they did that on purpose as a compromise to fall short of what God really wanted and they flawed it on purpose. I don't know. All I know is that that is important when you get to understanding legal document and mm -hmm. judicious things. And this is why we've got to learn to supplicate. Most, most court cases are won or lost on those kinds of things, a technicality. You know? Yeah, you, know, you go to court, you, you might be absolutely right, and you lose your case because you didn't know how to argue past that technicality that you, you didn't realize you had. Um, the abortion issue is a massive evidence of that. You know, It wasn't just a law condoning abortion. It changed the definition of what a child is. That was the flaw that allowed it to stand for so long. You know? If we had not let them change the definition and call a human being a fetus, the Supreme Court would not have passed that law even back in the 60s. You know, mm -hmm. Their own documents say that. Mm -hmm. you know, all along the way, it's baffled me how the body of Christ has spent dozens and dozens of decades now trying to write new laws to get around that instead of just redefine it the way God does. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so the, the the wicked attorneys that represented that, they're righteous now. I met them. The guys that handled uh, Linda Covey's case, they all got saved later. It's a massive evidential of God's mercy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that he would take the very guys that caused that kind of a infraction in our country and go save them. You know, she died knowing Jesus. They died knowing, I mean, they're still living knowing Jesus. And but they couldn't unravel it very easily because they purposely put a flaw in the um, definition of a child that they knew would cause the court to rule a certain way. You know, it was a scheme. It was a scheme. And yeah. it goes back to that double meaning. 
Exactly. And, and these things are really, really important. And, so we've, and, let, we've let the world do this stuff really well, and then we've become subject to it often. <laughs> we've got to learn how to do this well and not do it to be a scheme against them, but just to say, look, we're going to do something that God's going to tell us how to say it. And we're going to say what he says, and we're going to do what he does. And then his glory, his power is going to enforce it. You know? And I think it's going to topple things that are at war with him because he'll just release his power. You know, right now, I think he he still moves in part, but he doesn't massively rapidly transform things because he's waiting for us to get the judicial part right. You know? He doesn't want to make a decision as a judge if we don't present the case. You know? And yet we're, we're praying because we've got a problem instead of presenting the case. Yeah. And when I go to Jesus this way and say, okay, I've got a problem, but because I've got a problem, I'm going to go to court. Mm -hmm. But when I go to court, I don't want to go in there and look like a fool and then not get out of my problem. I want to go in there with all the wisdom possible so that the judge has to agree with my case. You know, that's what a supplication is. You know? When I learned that, I realized I've never prayed that way very much. You know, I, I don't go into, for a long time in my life, I went, I went and sat next to Jesus and poured my heart out and didn't, had no clue how to do it judiciously, you know. But when he began to tutor me in supplication, I saw his power go up levels. I saw miracles really. I saw, you know, major things change overnight, as many have with the courts of heaven. And I think that we've got to step that pace up now. So again, I'm trying to say, we're really on to something with the courts of heaven revelation, but now let's go back and let's think about the founding type of documents that should support it. Mm -hmm. So can I write a constitution that agrees with God's word? And now let's go back to court. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and if, if Jesus says, I endorse that constitution the same way I endorse my written word, then when I apply it to the territory, you know, now I can go to the court of heaven and every decision has precedence for the entire territory, not just for me. You know, this is what the Supreme Court does. When they make a ruling, it applies to all the lower courts. What we've not learned how, quite how to do yet is get a ruling in heaven and see it evidentially applied to all the lower courts in the earth. You know? mm -hmm. So my city council is going to change. My school board is going to change. My 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 uh, you know House of Representatives is going to change overnight, very likely because they have to bow their knee to the decision of the King of Kings. You know? We thought it was our job to get them to come into agreement with it by lobbying and by protesting and by praying in front of their doorsteps, instead of let's just do things God's way. And once he releases his power in it, then he's the one that humbles kings and lifts up his son. You know? And he'll do he'll do the work in the legislature's for us, I think, if we'll just get this part as good as possible. So Amen. Thank you. Uh you know, I've had uh, some thoughts along the way. I, I love change and I love to see results. And uh, I, I love Gary Beaton, I love the Liberty Charter, but why didn't we see massive change from that? And you just answered, I think you just answered the question because there wasn't a court system where we come up to Mount Zion and the law didn't go forth out of Mount Zion. Therefore, uh, nothing changed on the earth realm. Uh, so, you know, we've learned in the courts of heaven, any verdict from a higher court, a lower court is affected and overruled. Uh, just like his glory as a governing entity of God himself. It comes into a meeting. He comes into a meeting and it overrules sickness, death, disease, whatever, poverty. And same way with that law that's released in the heavenly realms, it's a verdict rendered in the courts of heaven that uh, overrules a lower court's decision. We've seen that over and over and over again in the testimonies uh, of courtrooms of heaven uh, members that have done uh, and laws have been overturned in the natural realm. It's just powerful for me. That's why I love it so much. And thank you for answering that question for me because that's what I, I saw. Uh, 
a wonderful document, but I wanted I want to see change. That's really what I'm after. Uh, I want to see transformation and that we have an impact and we have make a difference in in uh, every realm of society. Because I think if you look at back at uh, some of my favorite courtrooms of heaven scriptures, Isaiah nine is the whole governmental flow of heaven, and then you look at uh, verse one through five, it looks. Uh, you see the flow chart in uh, 6 through 7, and you see the, the results in verse 1 through 5. It's just overwhelmingly wonderful. <laughs> Go back and read the whole Isaiah. But you have to read Isaiah 9, 6, and beyond, and then come to Isaiah 1 through 5 and say, well, this is what happens when we operate in proper governmental divine order. And so I think that's what we're looking at there to, to establish... Uh, kingdom rule we have to operate you always said timothy get the pattern right and things will change and the glory always comes yeah yeah i tell so many people that same thing so that's true anybody else we are getting along about uh two hours here so uh we've gone well below timothy's uh capability of speaking <laughs> see said he did 17 hours one yeah, time so. yeah terry told me told me i had 15 minutes <laughs> <laughs> uh, i knew you said it with a laughter <laughs> yeah yeah always always yes anybody else have anything they'd like to share before we go Questions, answers, thoughts. Yeah, mind blowing, mind expanding, revolutory revelations, revolution. That's why I named my my ministry. The Lord named it Revolution Glorious. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "I'm here to start a revolution." So here we are. Uh, I'm all for a good revolution. By the way, let's let's do it. I would, I would like everybody to look at that Hebrews twelve twenty three scripture. Um, really pray that out because uh, I can tell you just by personal experience in Oklahoma that probably only maybe one or two percent of the incorporated local churches have gone through some process with God of, of trying to, to at least ask Jesus, are we actually in compliance with Hebrews 12, 23? Yeah. And it, it's like, to me, it's the equivalent of saying that I, I birthed a baby, but I didn't put a name on it and I didn't get a legitimacy document. You know? So if I just go up, if I already have a church, then it, it would be a really good thing just to go up into the heavenly realms and sit with Jesus and say, you know, would you make sure that this is registered in your in, in your glory? I, I did my job and registered it at the courthouse, but can you register it up here? And that one little tiny thing sets a precedence for his habitation to come in you know and if he says no i can't do that he'll tell you why he can't do that and you can fix it you know but if if you are legitimate and you're doing everything that he wanted then that gives his glory legitimacy to have an open door and i think we need to really pay attention to that scripture so. anyway yeah, thanks for the time and, you know, Terry, I'm, I'm going to put it on your court now, and it's up to you to organize the next one. We'll, we need to have a convention somehow. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll do it. Maybe uh, Oklahoma, central part of the United States. That would be fun, Oklahoma City. Why not? <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's been awesome, awesome, awesome. So, man, good stuff. Thank you guys for joining us tonight, and I'll have the recording out by tomorrow. Good to see all the faces and smiles and minds expanding and, you know, and it's just a good, good, good time. Thank you, Timothy, for a short notice, jumping in with us. Love you and honor you, the revelation and the anointing and the glory that you carry. And the, uh, whoo, man, <laughs> just love being around this, man. It's just like we traveled pretty extensively for quite a while, and, you know, that'd be fun to get back into doing some of that. And, and I'm ready. Yeah, I, I want to see you catch a fish with a coin in its mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm doing it. I am. I'm, I'm catching. It. Every one of them's got coins in their mouth. <laughs> so we'll see you guys. Thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll see you uh, courtrooms of heaven mentor group every Sunday. I think I put. Uh, if you're not on the group, I think most of you are anyway. So I'm not going to say anything else. So uh, 
Good to see you guys. God bless you. And uh, we'll see you next week. Good night, everybody. Love you. Thank you so much. Bless you. Thank you, Thank you, Timothy. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Timothy. Bye. 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 Good night.